Hi, I'm Tim Hubner. I serve as the chair of the Board of Editors of the Journal of Supreme Court History. I'm pleased to be able to talk today with Dr. Rachel Sheldon, who's the director of the Richards Civil War Era Center and Associate Professor of History at Penn State University. Dr. Sheldon specializes in the long 19th century. That means that she focuses on slavery and abolition, the Civil War, the U.S. South, and especially political and constitutional history. She's the author of Washington Brotherhood, Politics, Social Life, and the Coming of the Civil War, published in 2013, which received honorable mention for the Wiley Silver, uh, uh, excuse me, the Wiley Silver Prize for the best first book on the American Civil War. She's here today to talk about her wonderful article uh, in volume 47 of the Journal of Supreme Court History. I'll just hold it up here. And uh, it's an article that focuses on uh, 19th century politics and the Supreme Court. The title of the article is Anatomy of a Presidential Campaign from the Supreme Court Bench, John McLean, Levi Woodbury, and the Election of 1848. Welcome, Rachel Sheldon. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, tell us about your argument here. I mean, you are basically saying that in the 19th century, these two justices back in 1848 ran for president from the Supreme Court. That seems contrary to our modern understanding of what Supreme Court justices do. So maybe you can tell us about that. Sure. So this is actually just one example of Supreme Court justices running for president. It was actually pretty common in the 19th century. About a quarter of justices who served in the 19th century had presidential interests or had people who were trying to push uh, push them toward the presidency, including John Marshall uh, in the 1812 election. So th these two justices, Woodbury and McLean, uh, were sort of the most the latest example of justices who were running for president. And in 1848, they both got very close to the nomination. Uh, McLean had two years where he got so close to the nomination that we, you know, we might think that he they had things gone just a bit differently, he would have won and maybe even won the presidency, 1848 and 1856. Uh, and Woodbury had, had run in 1848, but then died shortly thereafter, although he might've been a candidate in 1852. So the, the basic idea behind the article is that we today think of this as a pretty odd thing to have Supreme Court justices running for president. But in the 19th century, it was not only something that the justices themselves were interested in, but people at large were interested in. So there was a great clamor for Supreme Court justices to run for president or to be considered for president because there was a belief that they were good candidates for that office, that they were well qualified, that they had the right kind of political background to be presidential candidates. And what that tells us is that our understanding of how politics and judging intersected in the 19th century was very different from how we understand it today. And so part of what I wanna show in the article is that the 19th century was different, politics were different, and the role of judges were different. And when you put those things together, you can get a better understanding of what the political culture of the Supreme Court was in the 19th century. Yeah, and picking up on that, if you could talk a little bit more about that uh, specifically, because uh, in the article, you talk about this concept of availability as an aspect of why justices might be candidates for the presidency. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure. So availability is basically 19th century politico speak for who is Who's going to win? Who could win? Who has the most backing? Who has the most name recognition? There's no polling. There's no formal polling in the 19th century. And also political parties work very differently in the 19th century. Uh, they are organized primarily on state and local levels. There are national conventions, but so much relies on what happens on the state and local level. So some awareness of the Supreme Court justices in these spaces is really important. And people on the ground really thought that someone like John McLean was a good choice because he had such strong connections and such strong name recognition uh, that he could actually win the nomination and then win the presidency. 
So what these folks had to do was to create large networks of people who wanted to support their elections uh, through newspapers and through sort of state and local legislators and sometimes other judges to try to promote these candidacies. Because in the 19th century, people didn't run for president outwardly. Uh, Stephen Douglas famously did that in 1860, but it was not a very common practice. And so no matter who you were, if you were a vice president, if you were a cabinet member, if you were a senator, you couldn't really go out there and say, hey, I'm a presidential candidate. Instead, other people had to do that for you. And the way they did that is to promote you in newspapers, to promote you in pamphlets, to make speeches on the floor of the Senate and House promoting uh, a candidacy. And the judges may or may not have been super involved in it. So I mentioned uh, John Marshall was a presidential candidate in 1812. He was not really promoting his own candidacy, but there were lots of other people who thought he would be a good candidate and were trying to push for it. Uh, McLean and Woodbury were both very ambitious and really were interested in the presidency in addition to uh, having other people who wanted to push for them. But um, it, it didn't have to necessarily be a case where the where the candidate was someone who was pushing for it themselves. So McLean is especially interesting, as you point out. Um, he seemed to be affiliated with multiple parties over the years. And I think, you know, he was mentioned as a candidate multiple times. And I think there was an like there's an early 20th century bi uh, uh, biography of him that has a subtitle like politician on the Supreme Court or something. Yes. Like that. So maybe yeah. we can talk a little bit more about him and and so why he ends up being mentioned by multiple parties over a period of time. Yeah. So this is part of the reason why I say that this um article is about more than just sort of the Supreme Court practices. It's also about political practices in the 19th century. So we have an assumption today that there has always been a strong two-party system where two uh, parties are sort of entrenched and fighting things out at the national level, but also the state and local level. But that really wasn't true in the 19th century. The political system was much more fluid. Parties uh, grew and died when the issues changed. And that was the experience that all of these folks would have had in 1848. You know, the Federalist Party did not exist anymore. The Democratic Republican Party or the Jeffersonian Republican Party didn't exist anymore. There were always new parties that were growing. And then when the issues no longer mattered from that particular party, they would die out. So McLean moved really fluidly through the political system because he had all of these connections to various political parties. Um, so one party that was really interested in nominating McLean was the anti-Masonic party uh, in the 1830s that had been railing against corruption in government. And McLean had spoken out against sort of the, the Masonic craft. Uh, and so he immediately became a good um, option for the presidency for the anti-Masonic party. And this was true of the Democrats when he was made, uh, when he was a Democrat, true of the Whigs and true of anti-slavery parties. In 1856, he actually gets so close to winning the Republican nomination. It, it's even closer in a way than the 1848 election. And among his strongest proponents was Abraham Lincoln. McLean was his choice for the presidency. So he moves pretty fluidly, but that's, it's not quite what we would imagine. It's not sort of a lack of principle, although I, I believe the Weisenberger biography actually does suggest that it is a lack of principle. Right. Uh, but, but it's really more about sort of how politics worked. And other people were not necessarily as concerned about his, you know, different political experiences. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, uh, in your article, uh, what you're really doing is telling us about how this 19th century world was so different uh, from our own, you know, because we sort of get this picture then of justices of the Supreme Court moving back and forth in and out of this realm of politics and service, either on the court or in the cabinet or in the Congress. So all of those lines are a lot blurrier um, you know, obviously than they are now, but then also li listening to you talk about parties, uh, parties are also shifting and they're fluid and, and you know, things aren't fixed and sort of hardened in the sort of way that they are now. And then maybe you could add to that just as we're, as we're thinking about 19th century politics, 
and we're and we're thinking about maybe even Washington D.C. Talk a little bit about boarding houses and the boarding house culture and how that sort of figures into all this. I mean, were there uh, boarding houses based on political alliances, or was it based on whether you were a, a U.S. Supreme Court justice as opposed to a member of Congress? I mean, how did that work? It's a great question because politics was so networks based, right? You, you who was in your network mattered a lot to your success. And so boarding houses and hotels in Washington were a great place to organize. And in, earlier in the century, during the Marshall years, there had been sort of Supreme Court uh, only hotels or boarding houses. But by the time of the 1840s, that had really fallen away. Um, Roger Taney, I think, was a little bit of a rec you know, a recluse, and he only wanted to be around other Supreme Court justices, but he was the exception. Um, McLean actually lived for many years in Mrs. Carter's boarding house in Washington, D.C., where he had befriended Alexander Stevens, the future vice president of the Confederacy. And they developed a really close relationship and boarded there every session for many, many years. Now, the justices were only in Washington a, you know, maybe right. two months a year. And so instead they were traveling circuit and they were um, spending time in all of these other cities, which which also included staying in boarding houses, staying in hotels with the lawyers who were trying cases in front of the circuit courts. Uh, so their experience was all about building these networks, both in Washington and on circuit. It's interesting uh, you mentioning uh, John McLean being in the same boarding house with Alexander Stevens. Um, Lincoln also was in the same boarding house with Alexander Stevens during his brief uh, two years in the Congress in the 1840s. So it's fascinating as you as you sort of think about how things unfolded over the next several years. But so so, uh, so you've emphasized the role of these networks and how boarding houses were sort of part of that. Tell us a little bit more about maybe how politics worked when it came to to the financing uh, aspect of it. And especially as we know, 19th century Supreme Court justices were not paid very much. They were riding yeah. the circuit. They were always upset about their low salaries. They uh, oftentimes stayed on the court perhaps longer than they should because they were worried about losing an income. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about campaign finance in the 19th century <laughs> and what that has to do with uh, justice is running for president. Yeah, camp campaign finance, finance not not very familiar to us. Uh, what was going on in the 19th century? So, um, generally, the way that elections worked is that you didn't have an organization that put together um, a solid candidate uh, ahead of time that everybody was voting for. Right? You know, in Ohio, for example, uh, it was very much a day of kind of thing. You might have pro McLean um, committees or groups who would come out, who would turn out for McLean during um, the conventions. But you, you know, it wasn't like today where there are primaries. Uh, no such thing as primaries in the 19th century, not until the very end of the century. Uh, instead, it was sort of a free for all. And part of the reason for that is that there was no secret ballot. There were no standard ballots, what we call the Australian ballot, that were introduced until the 1890s. So what people did is they would cut out the name of the person they wanted to vote for from a newspaper and turn that in in the polling place. Or um, partisans who were in favor of McLean or in favor of Woodbury would bring slips of paper with their names to the polling place. So anyone could run for president at any point. It didn't have to be um, you know, passed by a state law ahead of time. You didn't have to petition or anything like that. Newspapers, as a result, were really important to campaigns. Uh, and so McLean's connections with newspaper editors proved to be particularly useful during the 1848 campaign. Uh, he had a long-standing relationship with a newspaper editor in Ohio named John Teasdale, who became one of his closest confidants. He also worked very closely with uh, James Harvey of the New York Tribune and or the New York New York Tribune. And um, Harvey actually learned you know, much about what was going on in the court over the course of um, the 1840s and 50s from McLean because because they were such close friends. Um, and another was Gamaliel Bailey, the famous um, anti-slavery newspaper editor who had first lived in Ohio and then in Washington, D.C. So all of those people promoted McLean's 
campaigns through their newspapers, which only required the newspapers to be funded. Sometimes McLean would help with that. Teasdale needed a little help, but mostly it was funded by other people or by the newspapers having government contracts or subscriptions. It was truly a very different political culture back in the 19th century, wasn't it? Well, uh, yeah. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about the larger project in that this is an article that focuses on the presidential race of 1848 and two justices who could have been nominated for president in 1848. But tell us about this larger project. Yeah, so the project is really based in this um, relationship between the, the oddity of 19th century politics and then the role of Supreme Court justices in those politics. And I think one reason we haven't fully explored this in the past is that it's hard to put justices in the boxes of parties the way we do today, right? So, you know, justices acted very differently from the parties that they were nominated by in many cases. Um, this is sort of the standard story of the Marshall Court that John Marshall was able to make everybody agree with him and, and really compelled that. Um, and in a lot of ways, that's a misunderstanding, I think, of the way that politics really worked in the 19th century and the fluidity of those parties helped to create a very different atmosphere for judges. Their political backgrounds interact really in, in really important ways with that fluid political system, you know, because they had moved so frequently between these various political and judicial positions, they were really well ingrained in the political communities that they came from and circuit writing in particular helped to facilitate that. So the book, which hopefully will be out in maybe two or three years, uh, depending upon publishing schedules, um, really explores over the course of the 19th century how judges engaged in politics in ways that we would find totally insane today, but were perfectly natural to people at the time. And one of the big reasons why it was natural was that the Supreme Court was not super powerful in the 19th century. So, you know, the ability to talk to legislators and to cabinet members about political issues really relies on the fact that the Supreme Court does not have the kind of power to determine constitutional questions, especially that it does in the 20th and 21st century. And so that gives you a much better picture of why politics and judging interact the way they do. Very good and fascinating. And it seems that you have a tentative title for the book, The Political Supreme Court. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Very good. So we should expect that in a few years, it sounds like. So we'll look forward to that. In the meantime, of course, I want to urge all of our viewers and our listeners to go to, once again, volume 47, number three of the Journal of Supreme Court History, this outstanding article by Rachel Sheldon, Anatomy of a Presidential Campaign from the Supreme Court Bench, John McLean, Levi Woodbury, and the Election of 1848. It's been a pleasure to uh, have this conversation with you today, Dr. Sheldon. Thank you so much. Thank you.